sorry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this crypto asset bubble session, uh, which is a, uh, uh, developed in partnership with Yichai Media Group. Um, as the price of the uh, uh, Bitcoin sold by 13-fold in 2017 with extreme volatility, Bitcoin emerges from the underground world of nerds and criminals to become a mainstream investment today. And from uh, uh, today, we, there are close to 1,000 different crypto assets on the market, and also the combined market value of the cryptocurrencies surged to uh, 540 billion. And the blockchain technology that underpins it has become impossible for the big financial institutions to ignore. So are these crypto assets finally coming into their own, or are they bubbles, fraud, Ponzi scheme, index of money, la money laundering, or is the seed of the uh, next financial crisis, and maybe even worse. So um, recently, um, uh, the central bank have uh, entered the fray uh, with several announcing that they are ex exploring or ex experimenting CBDC, which is central banking digital currency with blockchain and also other technologies. And because the, today technology, uh, technology developers and investors and regulators and central bankers see crypto assets in different ways, and few people can ever be on the same page. So I uh, have a, a very big ambition today to, uh, for, for our session that I hope we can help uh, chart the future path for Bitcoin, crypto assets, ICO, and blockchain technology all together. And I, uh, you will be uh, uh, a little bit skeptical for me, but I do have this uh, big um, uh, ambition because we have a big and we have very good panel today. And so let me uh, introduce uh, them very briefly. To my uh, left, Mr. Neil Rimmer, and he is the general partner and co-founder of the Index Ventures in Switzerland. And next to him, uh, Jennifer Ju Scott. She is the principal of the Reading Partners uh, in Hong Kong, and also she is a young global leader. And next to her, uh, Professor Robert Schiller, and everyone knows you. Uh, he is the Sterling Professor of Economics and in, uni in Yale University in the United States. <coughs> and the last but not least, uh, Cecilia uh, Skinsley. She's the Deputy Governor of the uh, Swedish Central Bank, in, uh, uh, which name is Swedish Risk Bank. Yep. I'm not sure am I right or not. That's yeah, good. in Sweden. Very good. Yeah, welcome so much. Thank you very much. And uh, um, before we start the uh, uh, the debate and dialogue, can I uh, do a very quick uh, poll? Just I learned from the uh, uh, Jenny yesterday. Uh, are you pro or against Bitcoin? Uh, pro. Can I be halfway? Can we do polls? <laughs> you can. You can. <laughs> and against? No. Okay. Well, and uh, what about you? Are you a pro Bitcoin? All right. Mm -hmm. And how many of you are against Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Oh, only a few of you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's the starting we point. We should see. We can do this again in an. Uh, of hour's course. Time. I agree. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly what I mean. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, my my first question is for Professor Schiller. Uh, as a, a Nobel Prize laureate and also the world best economist on asset bubble and behavioral uh, finance, and you are among the. Uh, uh, the, f the, the first um, group of the economists <coughs> who blame Bitcoin as a big bubble there. And the, uh, um, in your view, how do you assess the fundamental value of the Bitcoin? Do you think that the Bitcoin, HEH, and the ripples will replace a large fraction of the conventional money someday? OK, maybe I can step back and put some historical perspective. Sure. There have been repeated proposals to change the currency. Very interesting proposal came in 1879 from Simon Newcomb, the famous astronomer who was reacting to the instability of the gold standard. And he proposed something called the compensated dollar, which is paper money backed by gold. But the gold content of the dollar is constantly changed by a monetary authority to keep the buying power absolutely constant. Neat idea. It was talked about. Uh, for a long time. Never, never happened, <laughs> okay? Another neat idea. In Chile, in 1967, they introduced a new unit of account called the Unidad de Fomento. 
again, aiming at uh, stability. This Unidad de Fomento is a daily interpolated Chilean consumer price index. There's a website, uh, uh, Unidad de Fomento dot uh, something. You can look at it. You can make payments now. In that. It's an electronic system. And it had a good foundation. Uh, but it, it, the funny thing is, it only spread geographically. Mexico has the Unidad de Inversión. There are other Latin American countries. So the spread of these ideas, although they're good ideas, seems to me to have like a, a geographical or epidemic uh, nature to it. Uh, Bitcoin is another really clever idea. I'm impressed with the technology. Uh, and it is spreading in certain quarters. There are certain kinds of people who love this. Uh, but it doesn't, in my mind, it seems to me it's technology for something else. It's gone viral as a currency. And it, it, the, the blockchain is important, but it's not going to be stable. And so I think, you, you asked me whether I'm for it or against it. I am for the Unidad de Fomento. And I will argue that every country should adopt what Chile has invented. And maybe we don't do that because we're not in the habit of listening to Chile, or we don't like the story or the sound of how it came about. But there are other ideas. And so I tend to think of Bitcoin as an experiment. It's an interesting experiment. It's not a permanent feature of our lives. We're overemphasizing Bitcoin. We should broaden it out to crypto, to, toward blockchain. Uh, which will have other applications. But, but in Chile's case, the, uh, the underlying technology is different from the uh, technology in the Bitcoin, which is, is blockchain. Yeah. It still is digital now. I mean, you, you yeah, it is end digital, up using but still different. a website to. Okay. And then. it has real value. Let me say, in any other country in the world, there's inflation. You are a renter, you pay a rent which is fixed during the year and change maybe once a year or then there's this nuisance of changing it. Uh, and, but so that means that the real value of the rent you pay has a jagged sawtooth pattern. Every year, it goes down until it suddenly goes up again. That's a dumb idea. Why do we still do it? In Chile, they've got it worked out. You do your rent in, uh, in UFs, Unidad de Fomento, and it's absolutely stable. Why aren't we imitating that? OK, then the, uh, you haven't answered my question. Do you think that down the road, uh, the Bitcoin will occupy the, uh, the more and more share of the uh, payment and the, uh, the money share we have today? And also, Governor, maybe want to uh, answer this question, too. Well, yeah, I don't think it's big on payments. You, you agree on that. Um, I, think, I think to define Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. But the, in the first place, do you think it's a currency? Or I don't it's not think it's a currency. a currency. I think it's a very lousy currency. I don't think it's a payment. It's a very lousy payment. I don't think Bitcoin is disrupting currency or money. Bitcoin is disrupting gold. If you think about what gold and reserve is doing today, Bitcoin can do that and do that better. And um, I, I couldn't help. So you mean it's an asset instead of a currency? But it's a governor, a value. do you agree with the, uh, yeah, uh, Professor I, Schiller? I represent the conventional issuers of money, which is central banking. Uh, money, if you think about it, I'm, I'm not going to go. Um, and I, I'll do a little bit of history as well. Um, so money is a social convention that mankind has has, has come up with to facilitate a store of value and uh, facilitate a medium of exchange. Uh, otherwise, we would go into barter trading, and that's horribly uh, inefficient. And also, you and, need and we have moved from you know uh, uh, gold to uh, in Sweden we were poor, so we used copper, and we have evolved into uh, paper notes. And now we have uh, the greater part of conventional money. Uh, fiat money is actually produced by the commercial banks, but it's sort of it starts with a central bank version of money. Um, but in order for money to be defined as, as good money, efficient money, it has to be a store of value that is pretty stable, at least in consumption, um, in consumers, uh, 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 from a consumer's a stable consumer perspective. So it, inflation, it must be, uh, have price stability. Yeah. And there has, has to be enough people who are prepared to accept that version of money in a country or, or in a currency union, etc. So in my view, cryptocurrencies, <laughs> um, Bitcoin and the others, um, 
the way I've seen them so far, they don't meet the criteria for be called, in, be called money. They can be called an asset, fine, but they are not a very good version of money because it's not a very stable store of value. They fluctuate a lot. Um, and it's not a very efficient medium of exchange because you don't buy your groceries with Bitcoin or you don't get your salaries in Bitcoin and you can certainly not pay your taxes in Bitcoin. There you still have to use the, 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 the conventional versions of money. Yeah, but, but Japan government defined Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, I've heard about that too, to but are they still, you still as a taxpayer in Japan have to pay your taxes in yen. Uh, and that is the critical factor that creates the great externality effects that makes uh, uh, a, a money um, efficient in an economy. Yeah, so uh, uh, Jennifer, I'm sorry to, to uh, uh, inter cut you. And uh, do you agree with the professor? And do you agree with the governor, please? Uh, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Which part? Um, uh, first of all, I pick up what professor said. There are certain type of people, um, you know, pick up Bitcoin. I, I can I can be more specific what type of people. The type of people who are a little bit rebel. A type of people who think, why for, in fact, you know, let's, you know, I'll talk about history. The first central bank was um, created in, in Sweden in uh, 1668. Mm -hmm. And for 350 years, uh, we have, central banks have unchallenged the authority to issue money. And you earn that, you earn that money and the money is, uh, uh, inflationary. Uh, Bitcoin is deflationary. De Bitcoin is completely mathematically defl meter. Deflation is a problem, uh, same, similar with the gold. So we abandon the gold standard. So if you use currency, I might agree, but if you use uh, Bitcoin as store value, why would I earn my hard earned money through my hard work and next year will worth less? Right? That's what happened with the fiat currency. Yeah. But with the Bitcoin, there are only totally in the world that will ever be 21 million Bitcoins. So the value to create more value has to be de you know, deflationary. Um, so, so as a store of value, I think Bitcoin is a, a very, very efficient. And either people like you or not, it's not going to go away. But what if there's a collapse of the price of the Bitcoin sometime, maybe this year or next year? Doesn't then matter. What, what do we about the storage of the value? If you want to keep the value, but maybe, bit, yeah, please. I mean, currencies have collapsed many times. Yeah. Many that, times, that right? Come back, right? And just so, I mean. But maybe uh, not Bitcoin. Maybe another currency because the uh, the, the latest news that uh, some uh, some kind of rating agency just the uh, uh, just rating the uh, Bitcoin and some other. Uh, cryptocurrencies and their uh, uh, their conclusion is that the Bitcoin is not a good one, but it's still the price is is very very high. I, I would I would argue that um, and first of all I'm very uncomfortable disagreeing with a Nobel Prize winning economist <laughs> on anything. So you can feel free to overrule yeah. anything I'll say. Um, but what what I would say is that you know. The reason I'm for this is that I'm an investor in technology and, and innovation, and I think this is one of the most uh, audacious, generous, and profound inventions that uh, we've witnessed, that certainly I've witnessed in my career. Um, and it does have the, the, the ability to help many, many people. Mm -hmm. um, but we're nine years into this experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and the experiment uh, has, gone, has gone well at times, and, and more poorly right now, it looks like it's, it's working. But it has been, by no means succeeded. Um, and it could fail completely. Uh, and go to zero and lose, uh, lose people's confidence. But it has accomplished a number of things that I think are remarkable. It's, uh, it's completely trustworthy um, with no central authority um, or entity controlling it. A distributed ledger. Um, it's a strength is, or a problem? Uh, think about the security it, it issue. Who you are. Think about the, uh, uh, the, the hack issue. Right. So, you know, it can't solve all problems. I think the problem it really uh, is trying to solve is, uh, is, is being exposed to uh, currencies that are uh, moved around at the whim of, of governments who may or may not know what they're doing or may or may not have your interests at heart. The people I know when you talk about people who own Bitcoin are some very, very, I know some very, very smart, uh, educated, rational people um, who grew up in Argentina. And, uh, and witnessed 
uh, their parents going to the supermarket with, with shopping bags full of, of currency and spending it all in one day because they're worried that the next day it would be worth, worth less. Yeah. Um, for them, uh, they don't have a lot of faith yeah. in the Argentinian government's ability to, to defend a currency, maintain its value. Um, and they also like the idea of it being transportable. So when you talk about somebody using an unidad de, de uh, fermento, um, what happens if they cross the border? Um, you know, what, what about refugees? What about people uh, in Iran or in, 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 in camps in, in Turkey? So um, it's, it's a very convenient, reassuring way of storing value. Sure, it's super volatile. It's actually quite inconvenient to use. Um, and there have been many issues with it. Uh, related not so much to Bitcoin, but to the, uh, to the exchanges and to the wallets that you have to use, which are kind of hacked together and not particularly convenient. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still a hobbyist thing. But, uh, but, but as I say, we're only nine years into this thing, and it's still, it's still trusted. <laughs> Um, and it's still doing what it, what it uh, set out to do, which I, f I find really remarkable. Mm. Yeah, I think Anil and the, uh, Jennifer raise a very important point is that uh, the uh, authority and money authority, some monetary authority or uh, all money authorities on this world is not that trustworthy because they uh, issue too much money. Mm -hmm. Governor, do you agree with them? Um, so I can't uh, talk for all the central bankers <laughs> of the world through all through history. I think there is a point there that uh, in countries, I mean, money is a trust, uh, and you, if you give up too much of it, you cause inflation, or if you give up too little of it, you cause deflation, and that hurts people. Um, and mankind, as I said before, has been struggling with this for, for thousands of years. You, you have uh, agreed about gold, it had an intrinsic value. If it fell apart with inflation, you could always melt it down and start over again. And then for the last three, 400 years, we have used more and more of paper notes. And then we have gone into the, the digital banking system. And I, I understand there are countries where you don't trust uh, the public authorities. Um, uh, and you see this as an alternative. I think it's a very poor alternative, to be honest, given that it's too volatile to be used as money. I have no problems if people want to invest in it and use it as an asset. I mean, you, you, can, you can use anything that other people agree has a value, you, you can do that. But if you're talking about money in an efficient economy over time, you, it's much better if you have a, a trustworthy authority that issues enough uh, money, not too little and not too, too, too much. And the way it works now in most central banks, and there are exceptions, I agree, is that we don't, or we don't connect um, the money, the uh, amount of money we issue and the price we put it to gold, but we have something else. We have the law. The law is the gold of modern central banking. And the laws in, in most countries now say, you should give out money and put the price on money or the interest rate to the extent that you cause price stability, which is roughly one to three percent because you have to allow for relative price changes. That's, that's how it works. And it has worked tremendously well in, in most countries. But if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. But you also got it wrong. You, get, you will get it wrong in, in, in the cryptocurrency world as well. If, if there are too much of us uh, interest holding this versus how much will be issued. So you will, you, that is the challenge we all have to face when we are in the money business. I think at this stage we have some consensus that the Bitcoin is more asset instead yes. of a currency. Yes. But if it is good asset, shall we regulate it? Professor Schiller. I, I was impressed uh, when I visited Lithuania recently. Uh, small talk that I had there with some Bitcoin enthusiasts. Someone said in 19, early 1940s, uh, Lithuania was annexed by the Soviet Union. And they said, do you know what happened to you if you owned a house and you had a portfolio of investments in Lithuania? Well, you, they probably took it. Uh, they, they defined you as a capitalist tool or something, and they took it. Not only that, but they sent you to Siberia as well. If you had had Bitcoin back then, they couldn't have taken it. That led me to stop and think, really? Uh, 
you know, I don't trust foreign governments taking over, but those things have actually happened in recent history. On the other hand, I think you would have probably lost your Bitcoin too, right? If, if all those things happened, you would lose your computer and you'd, uh, it would be gone. Uh, so maybe the whole premise. I, I don't have the full story of, of what we're... I, no, I think, I think you, you wouldn't lose it. If you keep your private key, as long as you can access to your internet, you, yeah, you have to memorize access. it then? Or? You, you can memorize your private key. You can memorize your... Does anybody do that? Yeah. Of course. And people put in their private key that. Into, a, into a safe. You know, A lot of people now, they use a hardware wallet to keep their crypto assets and to keep their private key into a safe. And I think you know, in future, uh, a lot of private banks, one of the services they can provide to their clients is to keep the private private key of their digital assets. And I think, you know, in terms of, um, we, we keep referring back, back you know, uh, Bitcoin as a uh, uh, currency or asset. Um, it reminds me, perhaps this conversation 10 years down the road will sound a little bit like when we say, my space is, doesn't really work, therefore internet probably won't work, right? So I think this is, uh, we have so to- So now we have WeChat. And now we have WeChat, um, because we, we have to realize this is an infancy stage of a potentially multi-decade um, project. And the technology right now is not perfect. I don't argue for a second that you know, crypto assets right now are all perfect. But you, you asking you know, where Bitcoin price is going to be, to me, I, I'm, I, I have been. Hold on, please. I will ask you later on. <laughs> no, I will go by regulation. No, I want you, yes, I will, I will give you my two cents on that. But the point I was trying to make is that pricing of Bitcoin, since the first time I read Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, white paper, I realized pricing of Bitcoin. Have is you the met him? I wish. <laughs> I was joking this morning. I think President Trump tomorrow probably going to announce that he's Satoshi. Quite possible. <laughs> um, so is, is he that smart? <laughs> he's the smartest guy in the world. Maybe um, in a different way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so back to my point. I think I think we overemphasize Bitcoin's pricing. I think that's really misleading because the fact that you know people keep talking of. Bitcoin today is below 10,000, it's disaster, or above 10,000, it's crazy. I actually think the fact that Bitcoin still alive, still attracts so much attention. The fact that we're talking about Bitcoin in Davos with Nobel Prize winner, central bank governor, and seasoned investors. Yeah, I think it's very good. But in your mind, uh, it which, means it's a powerful, which, yeah. a powerful idea. Right, right. Yeah. But which is your favorite cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, ETH, or uh, Ripple? I have the them all. I don't have Ripple. I have them all. <laughs> why, why, don't, why don't you have Ripple? Uh, because the price is so low? No, I think, I think you know, one of the spirit of people who came into this space and the very early on that they knew we exchanged a little bit about this is uh, decentralization, right? Satoshi you know, invented the Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin protocol in the you know, uh, ashes of 2008 financial crisis when everybody lost their faith in central bank. And so he created this decentralized you know, peer-to-peer -peer payment. He really intended to be a payment system. Yeah. Um, he mentioned this peer-to-peer -peer pay, you know, payment system really is to establish some peer-to-peer -peer economy uh, by the without way, intervention uh, by the way, of uh, do, do, central bank. Do, by the way, do you mean that they, do you hint that the, uh, the Bitcoins can self-regulate themselves, there's no need of the reg regulation at all? Okay, here's a very, this is a very good question, right? We keep comparing Bitcoin with US dollar. Let me say this, Bitcoin, behind Bitcoin, there's no Bitcoin central bank. There's no Bitcoin Inc. CEO overpaid and the weights crash and ask taxpayers money to pay it out. <laughs> Bitcoin behind it, you know, the there's no centralized institution behind Bitcoin, you know, borrow 200 billion, you know, debt. Yeah, and right. So just in short, is more trust or less trust? I think in, in the lack, lack of the I, I must bank. I must protest here. Uh, you're, saying <laughs> that, you're saying that people don't trust central banks anymore. Uh, let, me, let, let me get you an example of, of, of how at least they trust the, the central bank and the money in Sweden. The number of transactions in Bitcoin is one thirtieth 
of the number of transactions done by cards, which is, uh, which is a proxy for central <laughs> bank money through the banking system in Sweden. So it can be an asset. I think we can agree on that. I also think we can agree on that the technology is promising, uh, <laughs> but it is not a very well-spread payment method. So a lot of people, most people, and most transactions in the world are still done with conventional currencies issued by some I don't I don't yeah. I don't uh, what, what I don't, about regulation? And I understand that there are yeah. people who have different views right. yeah. but we still have a very competitive product Can I comment on yeah. regulation? Yeah. Yeah. Please I please uh, sorry so, regulation please yeah, first. So I yeah. so I actually do think it needs to be regulated because I think it needs anything to be regulated. it needs to be regulated just like anything that I would want to become mainstream needs to be regulated it needs to exist in society and and can't be uh, uh, there can't be this huge overhang over it uh, that that uh, promises to change everything because a regulator decides this is no longer cool. Um, so even, you know, and by the way, this is the same story of any uh, fintech innovation and the best ones have always done things that were a little bit beyond the boundaries of the current regulatory framework, but they've done it in a responsible way mm -hmm. and they've actually gone and asked the regulator to take a look at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the UK, for instance, was I think admirable in creating this sandbox yeah. to allow them to play and do limited damage if things don't work, assuming that you know they, they were trying to do something but, of but value. The, the so so it's just so, so I say so basically um, I I think that you know uh, there will be uh, object lessons, and I do think this is kind of one of the things I worry about. And I'm actually referring to one one of the talks I saw you give, um, Professor, uh, about uh, about narratives. Mm -hmm. You know. I do believe a government will probably come down very hard on a cryptocurrency and make it a lesson. And I do. And I, what I would love to see is for there to be uh, a, a role model where somebody actually takes an application uh, and and works with a government and does something uh, that corresponds to a certain regulatory framework. But this can only be done in one country at a time. You know, nobody can regulate all of Bitcoin. You can regulate the use of Bitcoin in your country or in your group of countries. But now, which country in your mind? Um, I, I think the, the most forward-thinking countries should probably do this. So um, countries, England? perhaps, perhaps <laughs> the, no. the U.S., <laughs> perhaps Sweden. Yeah, possible. Um, then back to the back to the regulation. You are very right that we need to regulate the thing that becomes a mainstream uh, investment target. But at the same time, the question is the sandbox will not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Who is going to regulate the Bitcoin ICOs? and how to regulate the ICOs and Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, there are already regulations in place here, it's important yeah, to remember. Some of them. So um, uh, if you see it as an asset, which most countries do, uh, uh, there is investor protection legislation, consumer protection legislation. You mean the ICO? There has been some authorities clamping down on, on, on platforms. Yeah, th that's about uh, ICO. And if you use it for, for illegal transactions, if you're involved in drug dealing, uh, anti-money laundering, uh, financing terrorists, you will be hunted by the authorities, independent of if you pay in dollars or in bitcoins or in, in cupcakes or whatever you use. So the problem money. is that you cannot regulate bitcoin today in terms of the money laundering, in terms of No, but of it's the, the activity terrorism. that is going to be clamped down, independent of which, uh, which currency you use. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I, I think, you know, the regulation is really, uh, in the past few months even, it's quite, you know, more and more clear. So you can, um, you know, apart from China, right, China had a hard stop in terms of the... Do you think China made a mistake? Um, I think for China, where China is right now, perhaps China needs to give a hard stop in terms of ICOs, right? But in over longer term, you know, uh, we keep hearing that PBOC has been um, contemplating issuing state-issued uh, blockchain-powered um, cryptocurrency. Um, so, so you know, I, I can see why. You mean CBDC? Central, CBOC, central bank. Central. You mean the central banking digital currency? Yes. Okay. So, we'll talk so, about that so later with, on. with that, I think it's actually very valuable for PBOC, right? You can have perfect capital control, right? You can have perfect, you know, taxing, uh, uh, tax system to, to collect the tax, right? But back to the point to, you know, Governor, I, I actually don't think, you know, uh, central bank, uh, people don't trust the central bank completely anymore, but 
what I find very, very valuable for you know, um, the gift from Satoshi to the world is to, for many, many years, um, we just assume that money should come from central bank. But because of Bitcoin, because of cryptocurrency, it really provoked a lot of people start to think, <laughs> what is money? Where money should come from? How much our money should be appreciated or depreciated? I think that kind of debate is healthy. Yeah, very good. And also a very quick question for Jennifer. Do you uh, have trust in monetary authority in Hong Kong? I do. I use fiat currency every day, but I also want um, um, a part of my portfolio, I want some of my assets has zero correlation to central bank po po policy, so and which is cryptocurrency is pro providing so it's right now. investment portfolio. Kind of thinking. Diversification. Think, yeah. But Understood. also, I think, you know, uh, in terms of tokens, right now you can issue a uh, security token or utility token. Utility token, pretty much, apart from China, is hard stop. But pretty much every country is self regulate If you issue a security token, um, pretty much every country will either have existing security laws to govern your security token, or their, you know, their central bank has issued very clear you know, um, indication in terms of how you regulate yeah. security token. Right. Professor, please. Uh, relating to regulation, I was recently involved in discussion with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange about creating a futures market. Now, they were, regulators had to approve the futures market in Bitcoin. Uh, and I think that was only last month that that happened. I initially opposed the idea. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not quite to your level of enthusiasm. I think the media <laughs> maybe misrepresented you a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes Thanks, that happens. But the, but, <laughs> Go ahead. But the thing is that what struck me about this is that while you, it was possible to short Bitcoin uh, via some of the exchanges, uh, it, it, it has been difficult to short. And financial theory says if something is not shortable, then it can be taken over by enthusiasts. And uh, the doubters no longer have an adequate way of betting against it. So we've just seen uh, both the, the CBO and the CME have both created futures markets for Bitcoin. And that might make it more stable. Uh, now, in fact, when people ask me, should I invest in Bitcoin, I have a follow-up question. Long or short, what are you thinking of? <laughs> and I can't, I, I can't really uh, uh, so, know with certainty which is view? the right What is your long one. or short uh, at this moment? I would say long, but not not more than you can afford to lose completely, because uh, because it's an experiment, and uh, and and we want the experiment to succeed. But one sure way of making it fail is if too many people lose their life savings, then it will go to zero because they'll sell you know they'll sell the rest. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also a uh, hold for your. Uh, hold, yeah, but I, at the same time, also think you know. Uh, let's be honest, right? Right now, there are um, about more than a thousand cryptocurrencies available in, in the market right now. I would say 1995, and perhaps even higher number of those cryptocurrencies would not be around in three years' time, because a lot of those companies uh, took this window of op opportunities, issued their token uh, with uh, a very simple business mm -hmm. idea, and put into a white paper. So essentially, they're, they're using. Uh, uh, seed stage, VC, angel stage um, business proposal to seek IPO level of uh, fundraising. And I think that's not going to end well. Now, another thing is I have to give some feedback to media. I think media right Very now... Very briefly, please. <laughs> I think media right now overly focus on the pricing and not paying... Actually, we are not. Uh, you mentioned the central bank digital currency. We have just published an article from the uh, deputy governor of the PBOC, mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, he declared that the, uh, uh, the thinking, the forward thinking of the CBDC plan in China by the PBOC. And you talk about the blockchain technology. Right. But according to the plan from the PBOC, uh, they said that the, maybe we are not going to use the blockchain as the uh, uh, under uh, as as the uh, technology for the uh, CBDC in their plan. So, Governor, uh, you also have an e-Corona plan. So, what uh, kind of technology yeah. are you going so to I'll, utilize? So, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, it has a different, completely starting point. The research project we run at the Riks Bank, and the starting point we have is that um, technologically and legally, uh, it become very easy in Sweden to live completely cashless. Um, and there is no legal obligation for banks or for shops to, to take notes and coins. 
uh, and it's very easy to use cards and, and instant payment apps. So uh, we see a rapid uh, uh, decrease in, in the value of, of circulation in, in notes and coins. And as a central bank, uh, we, we are sort of uh, neutral about this. We, uh, we think that people should be able to use the payment methods uh, that they find safe and efficient, as long as they're safe and efficient. However, going from a non-cash society into a potential non-cash society, where uh, notes and coins are no longer uh, useful as a store of value, well, it can still be a store of value, but not as a medium of exchange, is a, is a, is a new society. And it opens up a number of intricate questions such as, uh, do we still, can we still say as a central bank that we provide a safe and efficient payment system? Is it accessible for everybody? Because in reality it means that everybody has to be a part of the commercial banking system. And not everybody wants to be a part of the commercial banking system or are not even allowed into it. So uh, that is the starting point. We have to look at the consequences of a cashless society. Uh, is it still safe and efficient if we go in there? And if we find that there is a need for a, a, a public sector digital version, um, we are looking into what sort of features that would have. And that is what we call potentially an e-crona. And it's far away into the future. It's not a, something that we are doing near. And no, we don't know if we're going to use blockchain or any other technology. Uh, but it would be work as a as a one-to-one -one exchange rate versus the, the the krona that we have, which is the national currency, and it would potentially work as a as a complement to uh, the notes and coins that we provide, so that people also in the future will be able to choose whether they want to have a claim on 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 the on the commercial bank having the deposits there, or if they want to have a claim on the central bank, they can have it now with the notes but they potentially they can also have it in the future. Governor, very quickly, uh, do you think the uh, CBDC in Sweden uh, will be M1, M2, or M0? I'm sorry, uh, too uh, academic. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So, so that would be uh, uh, a, a digital version of cash. So the answer is would, it would be M0. Zero. The nearest version of, okay. of money. And also, uh, do you think it should be retailing or wholesaling? Means, uh, shall we need banking sector or we, we don't need them anymore? So, um, the reason for why we're starting this project was that uh, we see that individuals are um, uh, stop using cash or the banks and shops stop ac um, accepting and, and offer cash services. Um, so we, um, uh, if there is a need, it would be offered to individuals primarily. I see. Then they, uh, will, will it be anonymous or not? So that is one of other of the questions that we are, where the staff is looking into. Uh, my personal view is that it's perhaps not the core business of the public sector to facilitate uh, illegal transactions. So uh, at the end of the day, it would probably be possible, necessary uh, for be able to look into transactions in an e-corona for, for criminal mm -hmm. investigation reasons. But it's a political issue, and we leave that I to see. the legislators to when look into will, potentially. When, sorry, when will we see the uh, CBDC in Sweden? I don't country? know. It's a long <laughs> way to go, I think. Okay. But we, are, we have to do the homework since uh, cash is going out of fashion very quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, your view on the uh, CBDC? Um, I think, you know, it, it's in fact, I don't think, um, um, you know, completely outside of um, central bank system, um, you know, a, a very efficient, as if a very efficient payment system will really exist because I don't think any country, any sovereign country, um, any central bank will allow, there's a, none other alternative, alternative currency completely outside of uh, central bank's oversight. However, um, I do think that we haven't mentioned the term token economy, right? We, we, we focus on, um, you know, if, we, if um, cryptocurrencies is going to replace money or not, but, um, or if it's a store of value or not. However, I think, you know, if you look a little bit beyond uh, of the manic, you know, happening in the cryptocurrency. Uh, you mean the technology? I think the technology now create this kind of um, 
very effective, a very efficient micro-incentive system that will potentially disrupt uh, venture capital. Um, we are, in fact, and disrupting ourselves um, and uh, potentially will disrupt the IPO market, right? And I think financial market, I have been invested in uh, fintech for a number of years. And over the years, I have seen many companies mm -hmm. that always building on the same system, just incrementally make it a little bit more efficient, a little bit more transparent. But with blockchain, the underlying technology is by, the By the way, uh, let me ask you a very specific question. Do you think the blockchain technology can replace the RTJS system in the banking sector we are using today for the payment I think, system? I think the scalability is not there yet. Okay. Um, but over time, give it time, right? This is infancy How stage. How long? In it's hard to say that the acceleration is happening very fast. So I think the breakthrough could happen any time. Neil, please. Yeah, no, so a couple of things to comment on. I mean, the first is, um, you know, tokens and, and their use in, uh, in, in delivering other functions than just transactions or store, store of value, which is the primary function of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, I do think that's, that's interesting. And so if you think of notaries or, um, you know, uh, or title insurance, um, you know, things that require some sort of a stamp uh, and, and a lot of bureaucracy. It, it's possible to, it's, it's, it's quite conceivable to think of a blockchain with a token that's used uh, to, to verify those transactions and to, and to store them forever um, in, in, an, in an inviolable way. Um, but that's still, you know, I think it's a bit easy to sort of say that uh, the blockchain will generate lots of things and we're not so sure about Bitcoin. The truth is you do need, you need one with, with the other because you need these, totally. this way of, in, of giving people incentives yeah. to do all the work to verify this distributed database. I mean, two people running two computers is not as trustworthy as thousands of people doing this, right? So I think you, you can't sort of buy into it but not completely buy into it. You do have to buy into the idea that these things will be valuable. Um, now, what does that do to venture capital and, you know, and our business of, of investing in the equity of, of startups and helping them grow their business? Um, I, I think that, as it's been pointed out, there's a lot of volatility and there's a gold rush. And lots of people just think, why wouldn't I buy Bitcoin? It only goes one way. Um, and that clearly cannot last and, and, that, will, uh, uh, and that will not last. Um, but, uh, and so that's attracted lots of people into into the market and, uh, and lots of, I think, unethical offerings of tokens. Um, and those things will hopefully be, be regulated out of business or just, or just shut down. Um, but that doesn't, but just, so I, I, on the other hand, I don't think that every business can fund itself by monetizing some unit of exchange in their future business by selling tokens and not by selling equity. You know, if you think of something like Kickstarter, mm -hmm. I think of Kickstarter as kind of a proto uh, ICO in the sense that, you know, Kickstarter, the site where you can show some product mm -hmm. um, and sell it, you make a nice video that describes the product, hopefully something that you will actually make. Yeah. Um, and people will give you orders, actually give you the money, buy it beforehand, and you're funding your business without yeah. selling equity. Yeah. So be before we open the floor, let me ask Neil and Jennifer very quickly one question about ICO. Why China government shut down all the, uh, the Bitcoin exchanges and all the ICO? Because uh, according to one survey in China, 90% of the ICO uh, scheme is a uh, uh, cheating mm. scheme and cheating case. So that's the reason why the China government moves very quickly to stop everything. But how is the situation in, in, in other places, in your view? Mm. ICOs. I don't think China has a monopoly on that. Uh, I think there, there are a lot of people who are taking advantage of, of this gold rush and the fact that uh, and the people are not doing their homework and, and just buying things without, without asking themselves what's going on. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the whole thing will come crashing down. Mm. Jennifer? I think, you know, first of all, you don't need uh, ICO to tokenize. Um, tokenization doesn't really require ICO. ICO is a marketing process, right? Um, secondly, I think uh, there's a ripple effect in terms of central bank's a action and the regulator's action. Because in the past probably seven, eight months, I have spoken to governments from uh, Oman to Switzerland. Last week, I just met Switzerland's uh, federal council, uh, who's in charge of e economy. And after the meeting with a group of us, 
he actually announced that he wants to make Switzerland a, a crypto nation. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, uh, in Asia, Cambodia, Bangladesh, etc., a lot of smaller economy now. Um, they started to think, you know, if we just make our regulation a little bit more crypto friendly, perhaps we can attract a lot of capital and a lot of talent. And either you like it or not, I think we are really um, at the cusp of something quite extraordinary happening in terms of, um, um, you know, monetary uh, reset. In the history, every time there was um, a big, you know, disruptive uh, technology taking over, what follows with that is always a monetary reset from railway to internet. But now with the information technology, we've already at the end of you know, probably 25 years. Yeah. If you think about how seamless everything else you know, using technology, and then, then you think about our financial system, there is a mismatch. So who's there to say things not going to be completely different, right? Yeah. And I think you know, in, in the 90s, when people you know, talking with early investors going to internet, they, they always say, oh, intranet will probably you know, take off, but internet, you can't imagine and people. We, sometimes we need bubbles to nurture the new technology. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, it strikes me that the, what bothers me about Bitcoin is that the enthusiasm I see is like a speculative bubble. It's mm -hmm. about somebody made a lot of money, and I, I wish I could get in on that too. And it, and, and it looks selfish to me. There are other financial innovations that are exciting that I don't hear all, to me they're exciting. For example, the benefit corporation is an idea that's spreading. It's a kind of corporation which is halfway between for-profit and non-profit. Mm -hmm. It's a for-profit corporation that has in its charter a public purpose. So here we're living in a world where we're getting rising inequality, we're getting nationalist uh, separation of, and Bitcoin seems to fit in too much with that. I, I wish people I were, were, less, yeah. were less enthusiastic about making money. It's yeah. not about so, making yeah, actually, money. Well, I know it's not. I, I, I think know, well, you, you must have consensus that technology should do uh, the good for the whole human being. I think that is a, it's too philosophical, so it's time for us to, to open the floor for questions. We uh, collect all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we collect all the questions, and uh, uh, we will ask panelists to answer them together. Uh, please, the gentleman, please identify who you are, and uh, please be very brief. Uh, my name is George Bishesh. I'm a private equity fund manager and crypto investor as well. So my question is to Mr. Skinny. Excuse me. When, so, for example, you issue a crypto uh, cron, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it will mean that people will be able to keep these crons at uh, their own wallets. So the need for custodianship, like what the banks are doing, will uh, diminish. It means that a lot of cash will go out of the banking system, which they will not be able to use. So what, what, do, what macro effect do you think it will have on the whole banking system, and how, how will it change it? Yeah, very good questions. And please, yeah. Uh, please, uh, we collect all the questions. Thank you. Great discussion. Uh, I'm a journalist, but I'm asking as an interested individual. Um, you said crypto nation. I like that. If you could start again from scratch tomorrow with a failed state or some country X, would you make it a crypto nation? Good question. Do you, uh, which, which panelists do you want them to respond to you? <laughs> Okay, all of them. Great. Yeah, we collect all the questions, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Winston Ma from uh, CIC China Invest Investment Corporation. And a question to uh, Professor. Uh, since, uh, Professor, you gave CIC a speech, right, uh, a few months ago, um, and it was focused was more on behavior finance. I was very curious. Uh, you know, you haven't touched on it. You know, maybe take the chance from your behavior finance perspective to comment on this. Because of limited time, please be brave. Yeah, please. Thank you, please. Hi, I'm a journalist from Holland. Um, one issue that has not been discussed is uh, Bitcoin's energy use, uh, which seems to be hanging over the whole crypto world as a dark cloud, um, rising up to levels of maybe entire countries. Um, I'm especially interested in the Bitcoin fans' perspective on that. Yeah, Li Wei. Uh, so, uh, I want to build on Professor Schiller's point to challenge. You have no time to build. <laughs> yeah. You only so, have time to ask questions. Um, so for yourself, if a Bitcoin enthusiast do this, uh, view this as an asset, it's okay. But if uh, given nowadays inequality, the need to do uh, money laundering, 
and people's distrust of the government, everyone will just pile in, say China crack this down, these people will go to South Korea or Japan. And then when there is an eventual, if central bank do not act, there, there is an eventual crack uh, kind of fall. And then all the people, uh, Korean, have go on the street to protest. So I'm just wondering, this is not a steady state. Uh, central bank have to go in before kind of this uh, become a systematic risk. You mean the CBDC or the uh, regulation? regulation? Regulation, but CBDC can help. Do you have questions? Course. A comment, good, very good, thank you. So, so just challenge the view of the... <laughs> okay, and Ali. Thank you, uh, with Itai Media Group, my question for Ms. Uh, Governor is that, do you think it is possible or necessary or feasible for us to do some global coordination in terms of uh, um, regulating Bitcoin or, or the crypto asset? And I'm very sure, another question is that, do you think a next financial crisis may be caused by crypto asset because a lot of investment bank like Goldman Sachs are now testing waters to provide brokerage service in terms of uh, Bitcoin futures. Thank yeah, you. Very good questions. And I, uh, I see there's a um, hands from the gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the lady, please. Um, thank you. My name is Jennifer from ScanTrust. Uh, this question actually for, is actually for Neil. Um, we talked a lot about Bitcoin, but uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about other cryptocurrencies. And as you know, a lot of startups are now raising money and it's disrupting your venture capital model. So I'm curious to hear whether or not you're going to start investing into, uh, um, into the ICOs. How do you feel about that? And uh, what is your strategy going forward? Yeah, the lady here, please. Yeah, you. Hi, I'm a crypto newbie, but one of the things my understanding um, is, is that uh, the technology protocol behind Bitcoin isn't particularly scalable. Um, and so if the underlying protocol isn't scalable, how do you expect it to sort of do something like become gold or, you know, replace the reserve currency? Yeah, very good question. And the final one, yeah, oh, final two from the gentleman there. Hi, I'm from Geneva, oh. El Kazan. I was just wondering, the, uh, the Bitcoin is based on what value? How, is it just the demand that makes the price of the Bitcoin? What is the value? How do you scale the value of the Bitcoin? Okay, thank you. The final one. Jeremy Warner, another journalist. Um, it's not part of the, the problem with Bitcoin as a currency that it can't expand beyond a certain point and therefore it can't really accommodate economic growth properly and a, a bit like when currencies were linked to the gold standard, it would then become uh, deflation. I think we have solved that problem. You arrive late, I guess. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I think we have a uh, eight or nine questions. So the uh, uh, everyone of you, you can pick the questions you like and comment on that. Maybe Neil from you. Okay. So um, I'll comment first on the crypto nation. Uh, if you are a failed state, what have you got to lose? Mm. Um, you know, I, I don't see why you you know you could actually do. So I don't think you'd print paper currency. <laughs> You, would, you might do a central bank controlled uh, uh, digital currency, or you could do something that was uh, uh, distributed in terms of control, and you might attract a lot of business and, and, uh, and uh, citizens. So I, I would definitely try that. Um, the other comment, uh, the other one I wanted to comment on was, was the question about whether this disrupts the venture capital model. Um, I, I don't think it does as, uh, as dramatically as you might think. I think that um, there are still, and I think there will be for quite a while, um, invest, uh, entrepreneurs who want to sell equity and work with, uh, with somebody who's aligned with them in the same uh, security to, to build a company and to share, share the gain. That doesn't mean that that company might not at some point issue tokens, um, but it doesn't mean that they'll use them as their primary way of, of raising capital. Um, on the other hand, there are some ICOs that we think could make sense, and we are looking at those uh, carefully. And also technology, uh, the scalability issue? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the, it, 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 uh, that kind of reminds me of what people used to say about the internet and about the early days of Ethernet or TCP IP, that it will never scale. But shall we, we wait decades? Other things. Uh, I think we'll get there. I think, I think that these things, you know, uh, entrepreneurs are very resourceful. Engineers are very resourceful. Um, 
and, and it will scale, or we'll come up with versions of it that will scale better. Um, but you're right, it's not particularly fast, it's not particularly cheap, and it consumes a lot of energy. Yeah, Jennifer? I'll try to use one sentence to answer every question. Crypto Nation, wow. definitely, because, um, because of trust leap. We didn't use to trust a paper note, but now we trust paper note. Now we are, a lot of next generation are digital native, so why would you still go back to pay, you know, build paper money? In terms of energy use, I totally agree. I think uh, Bitcoin is not efficient at all, but Again, depends on what you benchmark against, right? If, um, if Bitcoin is disrupting gold compared to gold mining and gold security, and money spent on gold security and transportation, Bitcoin is not that bad. Um, in terms of money laundry, I, I, let, me ask, ask, uh, let, me, let me answer this question with a question. Um, before Bitcoin, what did we use for, for money laundry? So Bitcoin is just a tool. It's not the reason uh, there's money laundry. Um, in terms of global uh, coordination of uh, regulation, I'll leave to the governor to have final say, but I think uh, from my own experience, I think each government, each central bank has its own priority. It will be very hard to achieve a global coordination. I agree. coordination. Um, in terms of scalability versus um, um, uh, you know, being a very effective uh, store of value, scalability is measured by number of transactions per minute. So. If you use Bitcoin as payment, the number of transactions per minute matters, right? If you look at Visa, Master. Um, but if you use a store of value, you're not gonna trade in every all the time. So because you know it's disrupting gold and- So it's not currency. It's, it's not currency. Um, in terms of Bitcoin, the value, I think um, a lot of people argue that there's no underlying value. But if Bitcoin can replace even 5%, or 10% of, as a store of value compared to the global gold reserve, you can do the math that Bitcoin right now is still very undervalued. So it's adjusted from a belief. The value is from Bitcoin's Same as belief. gold. You know, gold right. price is based but on gold how has we value. consensusly. Yeah. Professor, you, you have more. Uh, yeah, someone asked for a, a behavioral <laughs> finance perspective. So I come back to the idea that Bitcoin is an interesting idea, but it's way over represented in our attention because it's like a speculative bubble that it's it involves contagious stories about people making a lot of money and that and that you don't like this but let me go on <laughs> it's not it's about not, money there are other innovations there are other things to think about that, I will arrange uh, me, another event for you to debate for the whole day on that. Yeah. But before that, thing, just, uh, Professor, would you like to answer the question from the uh, will uh, Bitcoin nurture next financial crisis? Well, that's the thing about central banks have been perfecting their art for how many years since? About uh, 350 okay. in the Swedish case, yeah. but most and, other and, 150. And uh, <laughs> I, I congratulate you. <laughs> <laughs> they, now, they now think that uh, they, they, they are, have a target inflation rate, mm -hmm. and they're, they're pretty much hitting the target. Um, Bitcoin, you said, will be deflationary, yep. maybe massively deflationary. Uh, I don't think have a good feeling about what that will mean for the economy. It seems like it'll be very disruptive to the economy. And we've got a good thing going with you people. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we do our best. Um, over to me then. Uh, yeah. The question uh, from the lady regulating globally or nationally, I think it's mainly taken care of. It, will, it is taken care of on a national basis through investment protector legislation, anti money laundering protection, etc. Um, uh, globally, it remains to be seen whether it's going to be regulated or not. Is it a source of new financial crisis? This is, I may have to. Um, uh, regret this for the rest of my life, but I, I think no, uh, I don't think this, as we can see it now, to be a source of the next financial crisis because the sizes I mean. and the level of leverage is probably, and it's not within the banking system as yeah. we can see it. Um, um, so uh, so um, um, th that probability is pretty low. The consequences from a macroeconomic perspective of, of keeping um, central bank digital currency in, a, in the wallet next to your notes and coins, next to your uh, debit card where you keep your commercial bank money, uh, um, it's a very difficult question. Uh, uh, there are different uh, research going into different directions. They open up a variety of, of, of tricky issues. Let me just finalize by saying that 
safe and efficient versions of money uh, that are being offered in ways that society needs in order to facilitate, facilitate transactions in, uh, in a safe and efficient way that is very beneficial for the economy. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you, Gavin. I think we have run out of time, but still I would like to take the privilege of the uh, moderator to ask you very quickly two final questions. The first one is that in one year's time, how would you predict the average price level of the Bitcoin? <laughs> and the second, <laughs> Second, in 10 years' time, do you think which currency will become the next great global currency? Uh, central banking digital currency of the dollar, CBDC of the euro, CBDC of the RMB, or Bitcoin? Maybe from Governor first. <laughs> uh, so as a, a decision maker in interest rates, I have to make a number of forecasts. Uh, luckily, Bitcoin is not one of them that uh, uh, affects my world as a decision maker. So I will not give you any forecast of what Bitcoin will be. Uh, on the question of in 10 years time, which uh, currency will become the next big global currency? Uh, I don't think it will be Bitcoin uh, in terms of sizes and in terms of uh, how well is this sort of integrated, used in the economy. And I think it remains truly a very open question whether any central bank have issued a, a digital version of their own currency addressed to individuals. It's a, it's a very open question. But and a lot of us, including the Riks Bank, are, are looking into it. Professor. Very quickly. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad you set the example for not <laughs> answering your question. I've discovered that when I give flippant forecasts, they get quoted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then the uh, global currency in 10 uh, years' time. I, okay, maybe I can guess this because it's not you as can, dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say the euro. Uh, euro. Yeah. CBDC euro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jennifer? Um, Back to, I don't, I don't like the point about it's about money. It's I, okay, Jennifer. I, we, no, we still have time no, next time. I, no, I, <laughs> I, I want to say this. I actually don't care about where Bitcoin's price is going to be because the fact that Bitcoin has been a, survived for so long, it means it's a very powerful idea. I really don't care where it's going to be. And I think so you will of, hold. Uh, I will Absolutely. hold. Um, I will hold not really, you know, pr primarily for the profit. I will hold for the idea. I see. Um, secondly, for the belief. I think, for the belief. I think, secondly, I think, you know, um, uh, for the belief and also for the idea, and okay. that could inspire a lot of different possibilities and imaginations right. in our new monetary system. And in 10 years' time? In 10 years' time, um, I, I still think that, um, I don't think, you know, a, a, a crypto um, currency completely outside of a central bank system will really flourish in the global. Is it Bitcoin or anyone else, anything else? No, I think it potentially could be um, um, Chinese central bank issued uh, crypto national cryptocurrency that mobilized the trade on one bill, yeah. one road. Thank that you. could be very powerful. Yeah, Neil. So um, none of them answered the question, but I have Please. to answer the question. <laughs> I'm happy to that. I'll take, I'll take the heat for the flipping, <laughs> the flipping forecast. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would say that I think- But Orwell, very briefly. Very briefly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, 25,000. Um, a year from now. Mm -hmm. uh, please don't, please don't mm -hmm. write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I, but I would also agree that as long as it's alive and higher than it is today, I think it's a success. I don't care if it's. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But the other, the, to your other question, I think a digital, it'll be a digital currency. And, and you know, your yeah. bet is as good as mine. Nobody said the dollar, so why don't we say the digital dollar? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, final poll for you. Uh, how many of you are against Bitcoin now? <laughs> Fewer. <laughs> and how many of you are, are pro Bitcoin now? Also fewer. Yes. Strange. But anyway, thank Confused. you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for our. <laughs>